Anyway. <laughs> Alright, ready guys? Hello and welcome back to Flex Talk. Today we are talking about hot topics. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> I get really horrible heartburn from like tomato stuff. Mm. Oh really? Um, so that's why like pizza is a death trap for me because it's got the it's got the lactose, right? <laughs> it also has just like the tomato sauce, and so I get heartburn and everything else happening. So my body's literally on fire. That's like if you're going to a party with Ola, you'll like they'll there'll be pizza, and then you'll go back to the pizza later, and there'll be all crust like ends. Like, there'd be all pizza with no crust, like, all in the box. Whenever, like, we're at a party and, like, Ola goes for, like, whatever food's there, which obviously is not part of her lactose diet, <laughs> I'm always like, Ola, air with caution, baby. Like, watch out. <laughs> no, the next morning, Ola's, like, Snapchatting me. And it's, like, it's 4, 4, it, it's 4 p.m. <laughs> she still hasn't gotten out of bed. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, so politics. <laughs> Speaking of shit. <laughs> Speaking of shit, exactly. Um, um, I would say the thing about – whenever I think about politics at Pingree, obviously I always go back to our freshman year, which is the year that Donald Trump was elected. Um, mm. Pingree being a non-denominational school with everything in general, you know, it doesn't have a religious background, doesn't have – it's not aimed to a, a certain sector of, you know, the population and whatnot. And so it truly, there shouldn't be. It, it shouldn't be as divided as it is when some yes. like election happens. Mm -hmm. but and that's also just kind of the climate of politics in general today, I feel like. Like, it's so divided. I think that, you know, there's going to be people who have difference of opinions from you. That's just, that's how life is. And we want that. Yeah, we do want that. And I always go back to what I sort of believe in, which is that it's okay to disagree with someone, but if you're going to talk about it, you need to listen to what they're saying and not just talk at them. Because if you do just talk over each other and not even consider the other, like, the other side, then you're not going to get anything done. That just, you know what I mean? Like, you need to learn how to, you know effectively compromise mom what she was just get, making fun of me sorry i'm getting yelled at uh, <laughs> i mean all right oh but you know what i'm saying like you need to see the other view and not yeah just yeah. talk at each other talk with each other take the best arguments from whoever's on the left take the best arguments from whoever's on the right and then like that's where you find the strong middle ground yeah, and it's very circumstantial. It's not going to – I don't – I think it's foolish to just take, like, an umbrella approach and say, if anything were to ever happen in regards to this topic, I would take this stance. It's very mm -hmm. circumstantial. Mental health. <laughs> I feel like mental health is a hard subject because – because there's, like, almost, like – there's so much emphasis on it, but at the same time, like, everyone's view on mental health is different. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like it's one of those situations where everyone's an advocate for mental health awareness and getting the, the necessary um, tools you need to feel happy and healthy. But there's also still such a stigma around it. And that's sort of what I touched on with Chatterjee is, like, you've never seen women be as empowered as they are, but you've also never seen them being so objective. Yeah. Five. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the same thing. Like you've never really had so much awareness for mental health, but you've also never seen such an environment that could be so detrimental for kids and for adults. Yeah. I think with mental health, the thing to always remember is you really do truly never know what's going on inside someone's head. You know, it's so, and some people are so good at like masking or covering what they're going through that it's super hard to, you know, be sensitive to what someone might be going through because you do truly have no idea. And I think that that was really kind of shoved in everyone's faces in January with every with all the suicides that happened. You know what I mean? Because a lot of those stories with the kids was that they were seemingly happy, seemingly normal. There was no really telltale signs that were obvious. Yeah. 
and um it's horrible but it's just like there needs to be more of a conversation about it just so people don't feel so isolated and so alone in their struggle because truly they're not alone like we kind of touched on it with Molinero but there's definitely like a big divide between girls sports and guys sports and like that's natural yeah but it's also like really annoying especially this year when there was all the tiktoks scandals and everything and like our team especially was getting a lot of crap for um yeah for like anything that we did and like it it's annoying because yeah, I like a good joke once in a while too, but when it discredits like the things that we've accomplished, I really hate that. Yeah. I mean, and I also the thing that frustrated me with some of those was like peop they would say like, oh, like they won like a state champ, but it's girls sports, so it's so much easier. And I was like, listen, like maybe like the competition or maybe the boys soccer game is <gasps> There's like, so much I can say. About it, like, like maybe it is harder because obviously, like, they're they're genetically built different. You know what I mean? It's it's truly a different game. And then also, there's when you compare boys to girls. There's one factor that they never choose to acknowledge, is that every boys academy player doesn't play high school. So oh, and I never thought of that. I don't like obviously it's your choice whether to play academy or not, but typically academy is the number one team at clubs. Right. And girls didn't have academy until sophomore year and then they got rid of it after sophomore year. So all the years at least that I've played, it's it's all the girls from the state. You know what I mean? And with the boys, you're sectioning out a very talented portion of players that don't play high school. So when you compare the two levels, obviously boys soccer, like they run faster, they kick harder, whatever. Yeah. But there's a significant difference in the competition. Hungary is, as a school, very recognized for soccer and swimming. But there are certain sports, and they walk into the BAC gym, and it's like the Giants are walking in. Like <laughs> the attitude of like the Giants or, or Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> And they're walking in, like, you know, they're big, big time. And I just never like that. I think it's so much cooler if you are this badass team and you go in, you work out, you lift, you do what you're supposed to do, and then you leave. And then, because that's your job, I hated the divide between or the, the grade hierarchy. Like, if I you hate seniority, I kind of like it. No, I don't. <laughs> Well, because we treated all the underclassmen with respect. There there comes a point where I have a thick skin. I don't care what you say to me. I, I really don't. But there also comes a point where it's like you're spending more energy on trying to prove that you're cooler because you're a senior than actually focusing on getting better and passing yeah. better. Definitely. So it's like if, if I'm like Ali Colella, she came in, she's a freshman. She's amazing. I loved her because she was insane. She great personality. Am I gonna be like, screw you because she's talented and she's a freshman? No. All right, we're gonna transition into talking to Dean Chatterjee, but thank you for listening to our take on our hot topics. Hot pockets. Yum. Wait until it uh yeah. da -ding. Da -da -ding. Okay, so today we are interviewing Dean Chatterjee. She's our Dean of the upper school, and uh, we're gonna ask her a few questions on this hot topics podcast. So get ready. Ooh, welcome. Can't wait to find out what the hot topics are. You have to make a lot of hard decisions mm -hmm. that might sometimes upset a portion of the com community. So, how do you deal with this sometimes constant stream of some not so positive feedback? So, yeah, I, well, no one's, you can never please everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So I've always sort of gone through the position of saying like, okay, the whole position is really about relationships, whether it's relationships with faculty or relationships with students or relationships with parents, right? Those are the three primary stakeholder groups that are in mm -hmm. the domain of this position. So I think building those relationships and really putting time into them makes delivering hard news better. 
It doesn't make it good, but it makes it better because you have something to fall back on. So if people don't think that you have their back, then when you deliver bad news, they're never going to believe that you had it ever to begin with. Um, so, you know, I'll use the SAC assembly as the toughest. I mean, that that wasn't just tough news for this year. That was like tough news for the last couple of years for me. Like that was that ranked up there. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of one of the hardest things of like having to do and having to, because it wasn't just students that were upset by that decision, right? Like there yeah. were definitely parents who were upset by it. There were definitely adults who, faculty who, staff who were upset by it. Mm-hmm. But part of that is the belief in the fact that we're all part of the same community and making a decision for a community. But part of it is also hoping that you have those relationships with people in advance so that when you do have to pull the plug and say, that, hey, this isn't, this isn't going to work this year. People don't think you're out to get them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Well, we actually had a question about that, just about sort of the experience, your experience um, with breaking the news about the SAC assembly. And I, I, I do have to say, I don't know if you guys know, but Dean Chatterjee is my math teacher. And I feel like we've cultivated, we've always had a good relationship, but I definitely feel like this year we've really cultivated a a great relationship. And I don't know, how well I would have received the news if I didn't know you like I know you and I see you in the classroom and I know all you want ever is for the best for your students and and I think that like was I upset sure of course did I wish it didn't happen of course but I also know that um you have our backs you're the first one to have our backs so you can't really you can't really argue because you know that you wouldn't just pull the plug to pull the plug, um, mm-hmm. and and it's also about realizing that things that happen out there that are bigger than you and if if you felt that it wasn't the time to be joking around, there's no way you can possibly argue with that. So I think a hundred percent, and you do do an amazing job with cultivating those relationships where when you do have to have those tough conversations, we know it's coming from the best place. Mm-hmm. So- Four people in the upper school, right, that t- have to deliver bad news on a pretty regular basis, right? Like the three deans and me, or they're just the people that have to, you know, we get to have the good and the bad, right? We get yeah. to grow up top to bottom and we get to help shape program and we get to think a lot of like, oh, what do we want to do for the kids now? But at the same time, we're bad news deliverers. Yeah. Um, but a lot so much of that is relationships right like i think you're probably talking to all four of those people during this podcast and that's yeah. not yeah. that's by design right you, these are people who have worked with you every step of the way like megan for example we never had each other in class yeah no we've grown to somehow know each other right like yes. that's sort of that's part of my job is to sort of say all right well how am i going to get to know kids right i do think that with you specifically you're very good with having a high level of transparency when you do make those sort of big decisions that it does make it a lot easier to um, understand, you know, from the administration perspective of why yeah. certain things can't or can happen. Yeah. And I, I think you do a great job, especially being in class. You're so open and transparent about what's happening, but you never like, I feel like you never step over the line of telling us too much, which mm-hmm. is obviously very good. I don't know how you do it, but um, Dr. Like I view you and Dr. Cunningham as very similar because you're both people that we can go to, but you're honest with us. And we asked Dr. Cunningham about how she goes about cultivating relationships with students. And she goes, I don't treat you guys like teenagers, you know, like I treat you guys like people and adults and you have an, you have ideas and you have thoughts. And I feel like you both do that very well where you, it's just a candid conversation and that goes a long way. Well, I think transparency, it goes both ways, right? If you provide transparency for students, they're going to provide it back for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's so, I think that's so important. Do you think that Pingree has done a good um, job of addressing controversial topics and like, can we improve this communication, especially in a world that finds it so hard to have a respectful conversation with people who have opposing views? No, we do not do a good job with that. I don't know a single school that does a good job with this. Um, you know, civil discourse is an art. It's about putting your personal beliefs aside and really listening to another perspective. And we are so bad at that as humans. Um, right? We listen 
and we formulate our thoughts of how we're going to respond to that, right? We listen to respond. We don't listen to listen. And yeah. we do this in conversation all the time. Like, let's talk, let's talk, pretend we're talking about a not um, controversial topic, but we're just in having conversation, right? Like in your mind, you're thinking about what you're going to say and what you can add to the story or what you can, your own perspective that you can share. Whereas having conversations about really difficult and challenging topics that people have very personal viewpoints on, it's hard to put away your own thoughts and wait and say, hey, I'm just going to listen to this person. Yeah. Without listening to them and being like, okay, not, not only am I going to listen, I'm going to learn something from them. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that there, there's some, we have a ways to go on that in the world. I yeah. think that Mr. Hanahan is massively influential. When it totally. Comes to yeah. Because he knows how to lead, present, and facilitate conversation in this way, a beautiful, in a beautiful capacity. Um, he's like a mentor for us all. Yeah. Um, right. When I was, when we were thinking of questions, for some reason, I always went back to my brother's speech and when he made that feminist comment and just oh, yeah. like, it was heartbreaking for me because my, and like Maddie and Meg know my brother is like, he's, he is my biggest fan. He treats me and my mother. Like he, I don't know what it was, but what it was obviously wasn't good heat of the moment you're under pressure he he made a mistake and i remember seniors coming up to me and cursing me out because of what my brother said and this whole idea of cancel culture and you make one mistake does my brother not believe in feminism does he not want equal rights for women G give me a break like he should have never said that but for seniors to be approaching me and cancel your brother f him blah 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 blah, blah. like um, I just felt number one, of course he made a mistake, but I felt like that was a time where we could have used that as a way to sort of say, we make a mistake. That's not what the kid meant. He, he apologized for it, but I just, it boggled my mind, the cancel culture where everyone's like, screw him, F him, he sucks. And um, and I get it. It was at a time where Donald Trump was running and sort of like these topics were coming up. But I just remember that. And I just, I, I, I was so sad. There were seniors that I looked up to that I played soccer with that we were friends with and they wouldn't talk to me. And it was, it was just wild. It's an unforgiving culture. Yeah. The world, the world's an unforgiving culture, right? Yeah. Very, yeah. very quick to pass judgment on something someone says or, Right, it's quick to cancel. You're quick to cancel. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, and kind of with that cancel culture, one of the things that really fosters that is social media. So, trans like transitioning into that conversation, how do you think that social media has impacted students in regards to things like body positivity and mental health? I am going to take a harsh stance on this. I think it is all bad. Mm -hmm. I, you know what? I shouldn't say that. There's a lot that people will jump on immediately on social media in a good way. Mm -hmm. right? um, I know that there are, that people will post things. They will be shamed for whatever, right? For whatever reason, they're going to be mm -hmm. shamed. And then you're going to have thousands of followers that will jump to that person's defense and yeah. be like, don't slut shame her, or don't fat shame her, or whatever it is, right? Yeah. So the mm -hmm. it is the jumping to people's defense is very, very, very positive, and it's mm -hmm. good modeling for kids who don't have a voice, right? To see that, to be like, okay, wait, mm -hmm. this person is being shamed and people are jumping to her defense, and I'm gonna use she. I'm gonna use she across the board right now, but it could easily be a he. Mm -hmm. But overall, I mean, well, I have no words for that. I have no words for what happens and what people see and what people have to endure. And I think it's bad. I think it's bad. I, I think I'm impressed and admire the fact that you have all grown up in that world mm -hmm. uh, and have endured it and survived it. But it's not like you haven't taken your hits along the way. Yeah. yeah. I saw recently on TikTok, 
there was this girl who's a very popular creator. She's very like young, probably younger than us, probably like 16 or something. And she was, I think she was singing a song that had a Muslim phrase in it and then mispronounced it or something and then asked like, is that how you say it or something like that? And then immediately everyone started hating on her, saying she was canceled, commenting um, like a Muslim emoji on her, on all of her videos saying that she's like a terrible person. And it's like, this girl is like 15 or 16 and she made a mistake and now, and then she's posting videos of her crying and everything like that. And it's just like, it's, 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 hard to see you know what i mean because you feel bad you, obviously she made a mistake and it was slightly insensitive but like she's so young that like it shouldn't have to be like that like they should you know correct her and everything but now it's still like a month later all about what she said and yeah it's all about what she said right and meanwhile people have forgotten the fact that she was bold enough to be out there singing on tiktok to begin with yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and if it just picked a different song this yeah. Would <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, I'm not defending her by saying that. Like, I know nothing about this one particular TikToker, but yeah. I know very little about most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think that I feel like there's danger at every turn on yeah. social media. I don't know yeah. how to scroll without holding your breath. Yeah. I feel like it's such, a, <laughs> yeah. it's such a paradox. It's so strange because we're at this really confusing and interesting time where we have never seen women be as empowered as they are, but we've also never seen them objectify themselves as much as they do. Mm -hmm. And so you have these Instagram accounts with these women who are presenting themselves in a way that is clearly going to catch attention right when when they're sort of very free with their body and how they present themselves and you have you know they have millions of followers and they're getting sponsorships they're making a million dollar per per advertisement post but also what's the message behind that is it that if you're young and you're attractive and you're posing with this detox tea and you're going to make a million dollars what is that saying to young girls who are following you i always think about a push, we had to write a, a research paper and I chose to write about the sexual revolution and how people tend to underestimate and they don't really know the lasting impacts of the sexual revolution. I think people really view that as a, as a great time where women were able to explore their sexuality more, the pill, things are just more accepted and that's wonderful. But also at the same time, there's a rise in pornography and how women are portrayed. And so you have these two things where yes, women are getting more empowered and things are more widely accepted, but through doing that, it's almost trivializing things that shouldn't be taken so lightly. I think another thing too about social media, and this affects, I mean, I have two older brothers, so I know it affects guys in some ways just as much as it affects me as a girl, especially because we were like middle schoolers going through like when Instagram became super huge and stuff. And it's sort of like when you see these quote unquote social media influencers who are just like on their images, they're just like look like, drop dead beautiful like unreal almost like these like like goddesses and gods and then um but the thing is like when you're growing up with that it, it sets like an unrealistic um idea of what is normal in your head and it, it's not even saying that necessarily every single thing that you see on the internet is fake or photoshop because they're that, that's not true but they're also they're also these pictures like if you really want to see what a, some, what a person really looks like, like look at their camera roll because then you'll see all the other 200 pictures that the person took to get that one where it's like the perfect angles, the perfect lighting. Don't you think that from, you know, whenever you start looking at stuff like that, whether it's fourth grade or younger or whatever, don't you think you compare yourself immediately to every single oh, person? Oh, totally. So going off of that, um, you're viewed as a strong female figure at Pingree. Over the past years, there has been a lack of female representation in student government and other leadership roles, but mostly student government. Why do you think this is and what can we do to fix it? So it's interesting. I thought a lot about this. Um, the public nature of running for student government is different than in other areas, right? Mm. So if you're if you're interested in being on honor board, that is a that's a private endeavor, 
right? You yeah. apply, no one knows you applied. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in blue key, you apply, no one knows you've applied. If you are interested in being the captain of a sport, that's within your sport, right? People outside of soccer are not talking about who might be the next girl's soccer captain. It's only yeah. talked about within that one circle. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think the public nature of student government is a massive component. What's very interesting, right, is if you look at classrooms across the board, there's no question that girls are more comfortable in a Pingree classroom than boys are in terms of speaking up, right? From mm -hmm. ninth grade onwards, I don't know about middle school, I can't determine that. But I visited class upon class upon class, and it doesn't matter the age group. Girls are the ones who speak up first. They're the ones who break the silence. They're the ones who have, who start and inspire dialogue that people jump off of. That is not a dig at boys. The tricky part is the breakthrough, right? The same thing can be said for SAC leadership. If you only see boys in those leadership roles, you are not going to be drawn to them as a girl, right? So you mm -hmm. need Ola to be the person who's like, oh no, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run this SAC with other co-leaders and I'm gonna be just as visible as everyone else is to make it seem possible. So <laughs> when you're looking at the slate of student government leaders, and if you're a girl in the audience and you see there's two girls in the group of seven or however six or however many and the rest are boys, automatically by visual, it's not appealing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I uh, speaking from SAC because I feel I feel very comfortable in student government just because I've been doing it since freshman year, and even though it's a bunch of guys, I I don't care. But SAC it get almost gets more personal when you're dealing with like comedy and acting because you feel vulnerable and exposed when you say something and people don't it's not well received they don't think it's funny and I remember I think I'm very confident and I feel comfortable being in a group with anybody but I remember the first meeting that I was a co-president I felt I was so insecure because I I didn't know how it still is a group of boys of men and there's like three or four girls mm -hmm. but it you I really saw it with SAC and it worried me I think with SAC too it's especially kind of difficult for girls to break that norm because it plays into the incorrect but long lasting stereotype that girls aren't funny yeah and if say if you are the SAC president you do it you do an assembly and it flops everyone not not everyone but but in in the president's head, it's going to be like, oh, it's because you know, yeah, I'm a girl and girls aren't as funny, and then it's just then it's like super demoralizing. Uh, what was the most pivotal moment in your life and in Pingree for you, if you can think of one? Yeah, anything comes to mind, like off the bat. We asked Miss Tan this question too, and she was like, "Oh God," <laughs> and, and she hers is more of a like something that stuck with her kind of. Yeah, if that's easier to think of on the top of your head, then that's one hundred percent okay as well. No, that's okay. But my pivotal point of Pingree is driving into the driveway. It's always the same. Uh, um, yeah. There is something very special about driving down that front driveway that and so the feeling that I have that is nowhere else. I have that feeling no in no other capacity, right? In no other situation. It's unique to that. Um, I think it is a feeling of total surprise. I think what I like most about going to school every day is that I, I have no idea what's on the other side of that the doors when you walk in, right? You don't know what's coming. You don't know what conversations you'll have or what connections you'll make or just what laughs you're gonna have with people. Like you just can't predict your day at all. Um, even though you think you can, right? You think you know the schedule and you think you know the plan and it turns out that you were totally wrong. Oh, I love that. That's really cute. Maddie, wanna end it with the fun little, fun one? Yeah, so every every interview we do we end it with a little fun question to just end on a light note so um <laughs> this actually sounds like serious but it's supposed to be like funny <laughs> um what do you see each of us doing in 15 years <gasps> oh well but mm -hmm. Megan is not hard for me because <laughs> Like running a whole nursing program, <laughs> you're gonna have you're gonna have like little young nurses looking up to you. Uh, and like nurse cow and nurse cow, what do I do next? What do I do? Oh, um, that's so sweet. Oh, but that's so true. Okay, so what would, um, 
what do I see? 15 years? I mean, 10, 15, we come back. <laughs> We're like, hey, we come back for a uh, reunion. Okay, Maddie, I'm going to do yours next. Hold on. You're going to be in some sort of like full on business suit. You're going to be very, very corporate. Like no smile, serious Ooh. business. Ooh, I can kind of see I it. like love that. <laughs> I'm no, gonna be like boss. severe. You're, yes, you're gonna be severe. You're gonna have <laughs> hair very like tightly pulled back, and <laughs> you might even have some sort of like, leather briefcase. Oh, <laughs> yeah. high end like, briefcase. You're gonna be serious. You're gonna be a career day presenter. Not that you won't, Megan, but you know you'll be very busy putting in central lines and all that stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're gonna be very. It's gonna be severe, severe Maddie pillow. I love the thought that's going into this. <laughs> very corporate. Um, oh, I think you're going to be an actress. <laughs> I wouldn't have said that before this year. And you, th I, you think it's because of Chicago, but I think it's because of SAC and Barry. I think oh. you're going to be an actress. That made my day. Ola always says that. If I you? ever, if I yeah. ever make it to SNL and I look into the camera, I'm going to say Dean Chatterjee. I'm, I'm seeing Netflix show, like, Ooh. yes, I'm seeing Netflix show. That's where the legit actors go these days, because that's, <laughs> the, that's the platform. Wow, that really made my day. Wow. Also, it's all those answers were just pretty spot on. I'm very impressed with you, Dean Chatterjee. Thank yeah. you. She knows her stuff. Thank you so much, Dean Chatterjee, for joining us on this Hot Topics podcast. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you.